Okay, we're looking at how to solve these equations, and the first four can easily be solved without a calculator, and they can be solved by inspection. You can just look at them if you know what the things mean and figure out what the number should be, right? Well, that's what you did, okay? But what I said was, you know, solve it using operations, okay? And you solved it by inspection, which is natural, because we've done a lot of that, okay? Let's see what you would do, for example, with x squared equals 16. Now you know the solution is 4, except there's another solution, which is negative 4, right? Okay? Okay, if you have x squared equals 16, you have two solutions, okay? This actually splits into two equations. X could either be the square root of 16 or negative square root of 16, okay? So whenever you have x squared equal to something, you have two possible solutions. One equal to the square root of that number, the other equal to the negative square root. So you, you need to know this, okay? Well, that clearly gives us x equals 4 or x equals negative 4, okay? So we write out the solution set is the set, I'll do that in numerical order, negative 4, 4. Okay? Now these braces are what we use to indicate a set. When you do a solution set, it is a set, and we use the braces to remind ourselves that this thing is a set. That gets important later. Okay? So right now we get in that habit. Okay, does that make sense? Now, one thing you might be tempted to do is take the square root of both sides, right? So another way of seeing the solution take the square root of both sides, you get the square root of x equals the square root of 16, right? Square root of, no, of x squared. Okay? Now what's the square root of x squared? X. No. Might be, might not be. That depends on whether x is positive or negative. If x is negative 3, then what's x squared? If x is negative 3, and that doesn't have anything to do with the equation. If x was negative 3, what would x squared be? Multiply negative 3 by negative 3. Oh, yeah, okay. No. I thought I, I was thinking... Yeah, I know. Your head's in this, so, you know, I had to, I had to say it in an obvious manner. It's 9, right? Yeah. So if x is negative 3, x squared is 9. Well, what's then is the square root of x squared? The square root of 9 is 3, three not negative 3. So the square root of x squared isn't necessarily x, is it? Okay? So let me, let me just make a little note here. Right? So what I'm saying is, just what I said verbally, if x is negative 3, x squared is 9, 
and the square root of x squared is the square root of 9. And that's 3. Which, for emphasis, ain't x. Because x is negative 3, right? Well, I already said, we said, if x is negative 3, the square root of x squared is 3. Okay? Okay, so, the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. You know what absolute value is, right? What's the absolute value of negative 3? 3. 3. Okay? So the square root of x squared has to be positive. So you know that it's the absolute value of x. Okay? And the absolute value of x equals one of two things. It's equal to x if x is greater than 0. It's equal to negative x. if x is less than 0. And I can put an equal in either of these, so I'll say if x is greater than or equal to 0, then the absolute value of x is x, right? But what's the absolute value of negative 3? What's the negative of x if x is negative 3? doing the absolute value of negative 3 using this definition, x is negative 3 and that's less than 0, right? So you got to do the negative of x. x is negative 3, so it's a negative of negative 3 and that's 3. Okay? Now this is really pretty simple, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to understand. That definition of absolute value. Okay, I don't think, even think, even though I had extremely good algebra and trig in high school, I don't think I ever saw that definition until I was in college taking calculus or something beyond that. Okay? I had to sit down and ponder it. It became pretty clear pretty quickly, but not instantly. So it's not a trivial definition. Okay, anyhow, all these things are related to this equation, right? And the reason x is the square root of this thing or the negative square root of this thing. It's because of this. And it all works together. You've got to kind of know it all. Uh, we will be dealing with absolute value equations. I'll tell you this, in looking at assessment results from pre-calculus, first semester, you know, this course from last fall, people do not do well with absolute values and absolute value equations. Okay, which is why I'm talking about this right now. So when we talk about it in the terms of an absolute value equation, which we might do before we're done today, maybe, maybe not, we'll see. Okay? You at least have seen this and thought about it, okay? Okay, so square root of x squared is square root of 16. So the absolute value of x is the square root of 16, which is 4. The square root of x squared is not x, unless you know that x is positive. Okay? It's the absolute value of x, because the square root is always a positive number. Okay? So the absolute value of x is 4. I'm going to write it like this. Either way, the absolute value of x is 4. Okay? 
So there's one thing that comes out of this simple looking equation that most people will solve and say that x is 4. Could be. It's not the only solution. Okay? And that's real important for what we're going to be getting into uh, today and this week in class. Okay? Well, that was fun. Let's look at x minus 6 squared equals 25. So we can dispose of this a little more quickly. Okay, what can you do to that? You take the square root of both sides. You can't just take the square root of one thing if you have an equation. If you're taking the square root of one side, you've got to take the square root of the other, right? So, right? Now, what's the square root of 25? Well, you suspect that it's 5. Actually, you know darn well it's 5, right? No problem there. What's the square root of x minus 6 quantity squared? Well, what's the square root of x squared? It's the absolute value of x. Okay? You'll agree that x minus 6 might be positive and it might be negative depending on what x is, right? So it's just guaranteed. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm turning a little louder. So, like, it's guaranteed to be absolute value. Like, if you. Yeah, the square root of anything squared is the absolute value. It takes a little while to digest why, but I've explained it, but I don't expect you to necessarily have 100% understanding of it right now, but, you know, there'll be problems that kind of pull this out of you, too. Okay? And they're, they're pretty simple. It isn't that hard to sort out. You'll be able to do it. Okay, so the point is that the square root of anything squared is the absolute value of that thing. Okay? Now, if the absolute value of something is 5, what's that something? What number or numbers could give you an absolute value of 5? 5 or negative 5, right? Okay? So if the absolute value of something is 5, that means that something could be 5 because the absolute value of 5 is 5, but it could be negative 5 because the absolute value of negative 5 is 5, right? So, now I graded or assessed about 30 assessment tests last night from various sections of pre-calculus. Okay? And almost all of them had some place where you had an absolute value equal to something. Okay? And almost everybody just removed the absolute value sign and did this. And didn't get a very high score on that problem. Indicating that most of our pre-calculus classes don't do a good job of teaching absolute values. This goes back to the fact that most of our algebra classes don't do a good job of teaching absolute values. High schools, our courses, you know, we're letting people through who don't understand absolute values. They understand a lot of things. Which tells me that absolute values probably aren't that important on an SOL. And that goes back to Richmond and the people that designed this. It's hard to design a good test. And it's impossible to design a good multiple choice test of mathematics. You just can't do it. But we can't afford, the state can't afford, or state doesn't want to afford, state has higher priorities than doing a meaningful assessment. And there are all kinds of reasons that might be so. And not necessarily because they're evil people. <laughs> okay? I'm sure some of them are, but I think most of them are really good people. So I, don't have a problem with that. Anyhow, okay, so you understand that the square root of a square is the absolute value of whatever's being squared, right? And if you got the absolute value of something, there are two possibilities for that something, right? 
And then we easily solve this by adding 6 to both sides. We get x equals 11 or x equals 1. Okay? Like, what's 1 minus 6? And what's the absolute value of that? So that one works, right? Now this is an important thing too. We check the solution. We don't just accept whatever we see. Okay? And x equals 11. Well, 11 minus 6 is 5, and the absolute value 5 is 5, right? So by checking the solution, we verify that it works, and we have a deeper understanding of why it works so that we're more likely to do it right the next time, right? It reinforces itself, and we don't have to do 300 absolute value problems. We only have to do maybe a handful or a dozen, okay? And then we understand it. If we are always checking ourselves, we know exactly what's working. If we don't check, you might have to do 10 times as many problems before you get in the habit of doing it right, and you're still more likely to forget it when you need it. So, okay. Okay, well, that's all right. Now, x squared plus 4x plus 4 equals 0, okay? You factored it, because that one's easy to factor, right? Okay? That's good. Now, you did a careless thing in factoring, so it didn't quite come out right, but you know, you're not going to do that, especially if you check by multiplying out your two factors. <laughs> You'd realize this thing factors into x minus 2 times x minus 2, and not x minus 4 times x minus 4. With all the 4s in it, it's real easy to write something like that down, so that's why you check. And I would be particularly prone to doing those stupid things. Okay? But I check myself. Then I spend days figuring out why it didn't work. <laughs> okay. Okay, you got x squared plus 4x plus 4 equals 0. And you factor that into x plus 2 times x plus 2 equals 0. Okay? Now, how are you going to solve that? Well, there are two alternatives. It only works if x plus 2 equals 0, right? equals negative 2 is the only number that solves the equation. Any other number isn't going to make either of these 0, and if neither of these is 0, you're not going to get 0 when you multiply them. Okay? Now, That's x plus 2 squared, right? And you're going to get the square root of x plus 2 squared equals 0, which means that the absolute value of x plus 2 equals 0, right? Now that, you would think, would split into two equations. Well, we could split it. Let's see, this could mean x plus 2 is 0, or x plus 2 equals negative 0. But what's negative 0? It's 0, right? Choose the only solution. Okay. Okay. 
Now the next equation was x cubed equals 8. What are you going to do to both sides of this equation? Square root. Again? Square root. Well, it's not x squared, so square root isn't going to help you. A cube root would, but you might not be able to enter a cube root into your calculator. And the notation for a cube root is a little bit confusing. It's radical notation, and I tend to want to avoid radical notation at this point of the course. I think it's more confusing than just applying the laws of exponents. Okay? I could be wrong. If you're teaching somebody to do things by rote, radical notation is great. If you're teaching them to understand what they're doing, you really want to do laws of exponents, straight laws of exponents, rather than the magic of radicals. Then you understand the radicals better. If you haven't done that first, you can't do it. And you don't really need radicals, although they're very convenient. Okay? So we're going to avoid radicals. What could you do to both sides of this to get x? And we've kind of done it. So now you want to kind of lock it in. Take the one-third power of both sides. Now, what's the rule for taking a power of a power? What happens to the exponent? This is one of the laws of exponents. And just as everybody came into class yesterday not being able to do the graphs of the basic functions quickly, even though I said two weeks ago, it's absolutely necessary that you be able to do these quickly, so make sure you can. That's the quiz that was on the end of the, you know, they had five different quizzes, so different people had different functions to graphs, and nobody's looking at anybody else's work, okay? Because people will naturally do that when they're sitting that close, at least to get him, okay? I put them in miscellaneous order and used somewhat different functions, okay? So that that wasn't a practical solution especially since I would expect everybody to be able to do any one of those in a minute. If you haven't practiced before, you can make the table and draw the graph in a minute. Beware. Next week there'll be a quiz that will involve that. Maybe something else too. It's going to count. Okay? I told them pretty plainly that you just can't... Those functions are the basis of this whole course. If you can't quickly graph those functions and understand why the numbers are what they are and why the graph shape is what it is, you can't build on it. Since it's the foundation for everything, you can imagine what you end up with. Big old crumpled skyscraper. <laughs> okay? It doesn't work very well. Okay, well anyhow, laws of exponents, same thing, and I'm going to say that to the class too. Told you two weeks ago, you've got to know the laws of exponents. If you can't write them down in a minute or less, then you're missing a key building block of the course. You, you can't do the algebra if you can't do the laws of exponents, okay? So you have to have that. Those two things are as foundational as anything in this course. Okay? So anyhow, you got this x cubed to the one-third is x to the three times one-third. That's a law of exponents. I'm not going to repeat it. You just got to know them. Okay? So what's three times one-third? You also got to know how to do fractions. It's one. Yeah, that's the right finger to hold up. Be careful. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, I don't take offense easily. <laughs> my, my brother got me. My brother, niece, sister-in-law, they all have bizarre senses of humor. 
And you know, we, we do a lot of joke jokes because you know, none of us are rich, but we all have most of what we need. So you're taking a crap shoe, you spend fifty dollars in a present for somebody if they don't need, you know. We all agreed we don't do that anymore. It's better than the kids who go crazy. Um, five and nine. Uh, okay, so anyhow, they got me a pair of socks, a pair of black socks with a hand with the other finger raised. My wife saw them and said, oh, we've got to give this to the grandson, the older one. Not, not, he's, he's, he's a teenager. He appreciated it. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to wear them to school, though. <laughs> okay, maybe with a pair of pants long enough to cover them. Got to be careful. Okay, anyhow, uh, digression. I'm not easily offended. But, uh, so you got x to the 1 equals 8 to the 1 third. Well, of course, that means that x is 8 to the 1 third, right? Now, you already know that the solution to the equation is x equals 2. It's the only number which cubed gives you 8. You, you do that by inspection. But if this was 9, you'd have to do 9 to the 1 -third. And 9 to the 1 -third is not 3. Taking an exponent is not like multiplying. Okay? And at that stage, you, if you want a number for it, you better have your calculator handy. Okay? 8 to the 1 -third is easy. 9 to the 1 -third isn't much more than 2, but you don't know what. Okay? Make sense? My guess is 2.17. Okay? And now that I think about it, yeah, maybe. Maybe fairly close. Okay. Uh, You're going to use calculator for most because unless it's contrived to give you a perfect cube, and how many perfect cubes are you going to recognize anyway? What about 729? It's nine cubes. Okay. 1216, 1296. See, I almost that up. That's six cubes. 1728. Wait a minute. Yep. Six cubes. Now, 6 cubes 216, that's 4 power 6. See? Even I'm stupid. Okay. Make sense? That I'm stupid? No. Yeah, that does. Uh, that do. Okay, so let's see if we can solve x to the 5th equals 17. What's, what are you going to do to both sides? You don't multiply by one-fifth. You don't even want to think that. You raise it to the one-fifth power. Because if you confuse multiplying with raising to a power, you're going to think that nine to the one-third is three. Even though three times three times three is 27. Okay? And it won't check out. So you've got to be clear on what you're doing, what operation you're using. You're raising both sides to a power. Okay, so you get x to the fifth to the one-fifth equals 17 to the one-fifth. And if this turns out to just be x, which it does, then all you got to do is raise 17 to the one-fifth power with your calculator because you don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't know. It's between 1 and 2 because the fifth power of 2 is 32. Right? So the one-fifth power of 17 is less than 2. Anyhow, that does give you x to the 5 times 1 fifth equals 17 to the 1 fifth. So the x is 17 to the 1 fifth. Okay? Now there's a caveat. If you have an even power, then an even power of a negative of a number is equal to the even power of the number, right? So if you have even powers, uh, you've got to do what we did with absolute values. 
But if it's odd powers, then an odd power of a negative is going to be negative. And you don't have to worry about that absolute value thing. I'm not going to go too far into that right now, but we'll come back to that later. Okay, so what are you going to do with x to the two-thirds equals, what did I say, 4? So what are we going to do to both sides? get you somewhere, but that's not going to get you where you need to go. I mean, it, it could be progress if you did that correctly and use your laws of exponents. You would then be able to make another step and find your solution, okay? But what did we do here? Raise it to the power. We raised this thing to a power that gave us the first power, right? What power would we have to raise x to the two-thirds to in order to get x? That's what I was confused about. Again? That's what I was confused about. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the idea of a square root or a one-half power, if you raise this to the one-half power, well, what's x to the two-thirds to the one-half? The power would be two-thirds times one-half, right? What's two-thirds times one-half? Well, you might have to write it out, but you're going to have a 2 here and a 2 here. You'll divide out and you'll end up with 1 third. But that's not going to get us to us. That's not going to get us to it in one step. To get, do it in one step, all you got to do is say, okay, x to the 2 thirds raised to the 3 halves equals 4 raised to the 3 halves. 3 halves is a reciprocal of 2 thirds. 1 fifth is a reciprocal of 5. One third is a reciprocal of three. Okay? So if I multiply the exponents, well, that's x to the two thirds times three halves equals four to the three halves. And that's something you can do in your calculator, although you don't really need it. You're probably going to go ahead and do that, okay? Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, and, and we'll see other things you can do later, but this then says that x equals 4 to the 3 halves. Okay? Now, because of what we can do, I know that's 8, and it's not too hard to figure out why, but we're not going to worry about it right now. That's something, and if it wasn't 4 to, if it's 5 to the 3 halves, you'd have to use a calculator. For 4 to the 3 halves, it turns out, that we can take the one-half power of 4, which is 2, and then raise that to the third power and get 8. Okay? I said that fast. If you understood it, fine. If you really want to understand it, go 